And welcome back to the Awake Nation with uh, Penny L.A. Shepard and David Zubelik on this Friday, March the 8th, 2024. It reminds me of a story about the uh, woman, you know, she's in her bedroom looking at herself in the mirror and admiring herself and her husband comes in and he says, what are you doing? She goes, well, I just got back from the doctor today. And he said, I have the body of a 20 year old. And he said, really? He said, did he say anything about your 60 year old ass? And she said, <laughs> your name never came up. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I just, I had, I, the, old one, the old one is I have a body of a 20 year old. And then the response is, don't you think you should give it back? Yeah, I think yeah, exactly. <laughs> let's let's go someplace where we need to be and bring in Mark Matheny, who joins us on a regular basis. Mark, how are you today? Good to see you. Hey, everybody! Sorry, my mic was muted. Uh, how are you? I'm good. Man, we're fantastic. All right. Am I coming in clear? You are, you are loud and clear. Right. Ten four. Love I your know, cap. Last man. week you had. Some issues with that so i want to make sure that i am coming in loud and clear so um yeah good morning everyone um lots of stuff going on we had that state of the disunion right by Biden. Oh my god and i you know to be honest i didn't get a chance to really watch it which you know i lost a lot of sleep over right Not, um, i skimmed um, through it this morning i just couldn't do it i really couldn't yeah. i saw highlights of it yeah, uh, so I think they gave him enough speed or something to keep him going for the for the duration of the State of the Union. But right. I did notice that he apparently they're making a big deal that he didn't mention Trump the whole time, which, you know, uh, PR wise, that was a good thing for him. You know, I'm not well, actually he attacked Republicans. He he talked about, you know, unity. And then he spent a majority of the time just attacking Republicans. And they usually do that. They want to try to make it look like the Republicans are not, uh, you know, unified and so on. But we really know when the Democrats call Trump the divider in chief, we really know who the divider in chief is. I mean, um, you know, it reminds me when they say that Trump is a divider. I think of the Messiah when he said that he didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. And, you know, the reason why was because of the opposition wasn't because of the Messiah, but the opposition in and the same way. He said, a lot of people don't know that Jesus said that. I'm sorry. Okay. What now? A lot of people do not know that Jesus said, I come with a sword. He expects us to take right. up that battle. It's not all peace, love and kumbaya. Here. Right. And so what I mean by that is that, you know, Trump in a sense, I'm not in any way comparing Trump to Messiah, but what I'm saying no. is when a person comes to unify, they often, accuse them of dividing and at the same time the messiah knew that and so that's why he was saying it he said i haven't come to bring peace but a sword because he knew the message would bring division and, and and that they would fight against it but it's the same way with the democrats that fight against unification of the united states and making america great because they're on the side of the 2030 agenda and uh the great reset and everything so but what I wanted to talk about real quick, this today primarily was this New York National Guard troops being sent to the subway. Yes. Um, supposedly to fight crime. Right. And um, uh, real quick for, I don't know, you know, maybe people uh, on the show haven't seen, you know, what's this about? You know, what are they talking about? So. If you want, I have a, a brief, it's like three minutes long, just a, a cap from Fox News on what's going on with this. And they're talking about crime. So crime. this continues is, uh, to surge in New York City Democrat. subways. Everybody knows it. I mean, so this Governor is Kathy News. Hochul is stepping in, not by going after criminals, but by calling in the National Guard so you feel better. They will search everybody's bags for weapons before they get on the train. Our next guest is no stranger to these kinds of policies. He is defending Marine veteran Danny Penny, who's facing charges for the chokehold death of a homeless man who was witness saying threatening things to passengers on a subway. This happened last year. Attorney General Thomas Kniff joins us right now. Tom, great to see you. Your thoughts about how 200 state cops and 750 National Guardsmen are now going to the subway. That's about time. I, I mean, look, you know, I, I just wish that 
it didn't take this long for there to be a realization, a recognition among our elected leaders that there is a crisis that's going on in the subways in New York City. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if uh, too little too late is the right expression, but, you know, better late than never, perhaps. Good Samaritan last night was just stabbed in the hand when he jumped in in between of, uh, to help a woman that was being harassed 1240 in the morning. We see a conductor get slashed in the neck. That's some of the danger your clients saw. And what are some of the witnesses saying they felt when Danny Penny sprung into action? It was interesting. I, I listened to some of the sound bites from the governor's uh, press conference where she uh, introduced this policy. And one of the things that really struck me is, you know, she talked about wanting to comfort the senior citizen on the subway train, uh, the high school kids going to school using New York City subways, and the mother with a stroller or w with their yeah. children on the on the train and want to make wanting to make them feel safe. That basically describes to a T at least three of the individuals that were on the subway car when Jordan nearly uh, came in and started threatening everybody and, and, and threatening people and putting fear of, of death in people as they testified. Uh, you know, it almost made me wonder, did the governor read our motions in this case before giving that press release? With the rise in crime that is acknowledged, do you think that your case could get dismissed? Or in your mind, is this gonna go all the way through? Listen, we're, we're preparing, uh, our client is presumed innocent. He's entitled to a fair trial. I have no doubt that, that, that he's going to get one. I have no doubt that the verdict in this case will be the right verdict, meaning acquitting him. But we're preparing to go to trial. Um, you know, there's no indication that anything else is going to happen. And we're taking all the steps necessary to give him the best defense in this case. There's people in that subway car. Did they feel they were under threat? Well, they absolutely felt they were under threat. Not only did they feel they were under threat, that's the testimony that they gave under oath to the grand jury. We had about a, the, the, the district attorney uh, uh, called about a dozen witnesses and, and almost unanimously, every single person described the absolute terror that Jordan nearly introduced onto that subway car. And the All right, um, I'm going to stop the rest of that. But the, the, the biggest thing I wanted to show was, you know, how – even this attorney who's defending this uh, gentleman who defended passengers on the subway. Uh, it, I'm going to break all this down because, you know, it's a big psyop in a sense, because on one hand, yes, you need to have protected subways. I get it. But if you go to D.C., you've got the you've got a subway system there, the the metro system. Um, uh, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. Um, I had applied to be a police officer there uh, back in the 90s, um, and but they just didn't have the the um, you know they didn't they weren't hiring at the time. I passed all the tests and everything, um, and they were going to make me a, a plain clothes rider on the subway because I looked so young back then. But they they have clean subways. They don't have the crime. They don't have the problems, and they don't have National Guard troops sitting in the subway. So my point is here, this attorney, God bless him, uh, is sitting here saying, well, it's about time that they did this. My thing is this, it's the Hegelian dialectic. It's the problem reaction solution scenario that they want. Think about the Democrats. They're the ones that wanted to defund the police, not have any police, just have some therapists out there. <laughs> you know, I guess they were going to carry couches with them so that, you know, when they catch the criminal, they put him on the couch, lay him back and say, okay, let's talk about this. Now they're the same ones that are throwing National Guard troops into subways and stuff. And so my point is with this, we have to be aware that this was a long-term strategy from the beginning. And this is why we also have the immigration crisis because it's part of that plan. You flood the United States with all these different immigrants, create the crisis and then bring about the solution. And right. so, you know, you think about Yuri Bezmenov. I, I talk about him a lot, but he was a KGB defector. He talked with G. Edward Griffin a long time back and said the plan to destroy a country and communize it would be to demoralize it, then destabilize it, then create a crisis and normalize it. So they've already done a lot of the demoralization in the United States with destroying the Constitution, saying the national anthem is racist and the flag is racist and, you know, the statues are all racist and taking those things away and then destabilizing the country financially, economically uh, through several measures. 
and then creating a crisis. And we know the major crisis was in 2020 with the COVID. But right. after that, they create then what I talk about, poly crisis, multiple crises at once so that it kind of keeps people off off keel. You know, uh, the average person doesn't know a whole lot about Ukraine. They don't know a whole lot about the Middle East. They know these things are happening. And then with that comes a lot of speculation and fear because the mainstream media can push that. But what I want to show people is um, remember now I'm going to I'm going to say something that, you know, might get on some people's nerves. But I just want to bring this out. I, you know, in this election coming up, I will probably vote for Trump um, if he is, you know, I mean, he's. I'm sure he's, he's probably going to win, uh, whether he gets in or not, he'll win yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, just that's like he did in 2020, point. but, but he was one of them that if you go in and look at some of the policies that he said he would usher in, one of the big things he said is he was going to build massive concentration camps for these immigrants to hold them until they get them out of here. Well, you know, I don't care who says that that always rubs me the wrong way. Because right. I think of Operation Garden Plot, Operation Rex 84, you know, where the U.S. government set up Rex 84 program for um, to detain large amounts of American citizens or what they say, massive amounts of immigrants coming into the United States. But if you look under those provisions under Operation Garden Plot, they talked about a plan to respond to domestic civil disturbances within the United States. Okay. The plan was developed in response to civil disorders of the 1960s and now is under the control of the U S Northern command. And it provides federal military law enforcement assistance to local governments during times of major civil disturbances. And uh, they did use it once in the uh, 1992 riots. Remember in LA, what was you going to say something, David? I was going to say it's, it's not a violation of posse comitatus to get the military involved in law enforcement. And they that's did a away with the posse comitatus act. Mm. They did away with that. They they put in some bylaws now where they they overrode that and oh, with right. the uh, nine eleven attacks and stuff. That's part of the Patriot Act and um, the NDAA National Defense Authorization Act. And NSPD 51. Um, so these measures, that's part of why I believe 9-11 attacks happened. Of course, they wanted to go into Afghanistan. They had to have a reason to go into Afghanistan. They wanted to control the opium fields there. But also, they wanted to pass new legislation for greater uh, surveillance on American citizens and prep for uh, a massive disturbance in case of a civil war. Because I believe they know that, you know, this coming 2024 election could definitely end up in a civil war. And in ways, we are already in a civil war, but it's kind of a a civil civil war. <laughs> it's not so uncivil yet. It's not the uncivil war. It's now just the civil war. So we're all being civil about it. Uh, but sooner or later, it may get uncivil. So maybe I just came up with a new word. You know, the uncivil war uh, is coming. But for right now, it's kind of civil still, but I think they're prepping. And then you have Rex 84 program, and that was under Ronald Reagan. Remember, they came out with this Rex 84. I want to show you guys something as a matter of fact while we're talking about the Rex 84 program. This will give the audience a great uh, view of what uh, I'm talking about. Let me pull this up real quick. Uh, so, yeah, if you don't mind, if you could share this video, I'll play this. Remember Oliver North and the conference. In your work at the uh, NSC, were you not assigned at one time to work on plans for the continuity of government in the event of a major disaster? Mr. Chairman, I believe that question touches upon a highly sensitive and classified area. So may I request that you not touch upon that, sir? I was particularly concerned, Mr. Chairman, because I read in Miami papers and several others that there had been a plan uh, developed by that same agency. 
a contingency plan in the event of emergency that would suspend the American Constitution. And I was deeply concerned about it and wondered if that was the area in which he had worked. I believe yeah, he was. Yeah, I most, I to yeah, I most respectfully request that that matter not be touched upon at this stage. Ooh. To get into this, I'm certain arrangements can be made for an executive session. Wow. So, shut down. Yeah, and they shut him down, of course. Um, oh, sorry. And so the point is that's part of the Rex 84 program. They had a lot of different um, – th there was a bunch of them. I, I can't even think of all the different operations. But remember, uh, during the early 2000s, too, they were having National Guard troops going on the streets and prepping – going house to house and then we had of course the tragedy down in uh the um hurricane katrina right. where they went and they disarmed american citizens yes, they did. we see the famous news broadcast of the police chief there oh, everyone will be uh, disarmed um so where is our you know um constitution that says you shall not infringe upon my right to keep and bear arms i mean in emergencies, that's when I need my arms the most. Yes. So, you know, when everything's calm, they let you keep your gun. And as soon as all hell breaks, they well, we got to take everybody's guns. The only people's guns they take are the law-abiding citizens, however. It's true. But the other thing is, so you're looking at Rex 84, you're looking at Garden Plot, these plans. And then we go back to the early 1940s during the war. When Japanese Americans who were citizens of the United States, good people who wanted to serve and serve the country, instead we decided to put them in concentration camps here in the United States and, uh, you know, out west. And a lot of people don't understand. There was a lot of them put in there. There were even some Russians and even some Italians put in these concentration camps, smaller numbers. But uh, people tr who attempted to leave, they shot them. There is record of. 15 people, I believe, that they shot trying to leave these concentration camps without permission. And then once they did shut everything down, they gave them each 25 bucks each and said, ah, good luck, you know. Um, so, you know, hats off to the Japanese Americans today. I just want to say that to them who put up with that nonsense at, by our own government. So for people out there that say, oh, they'd never do this or that, look at January 6th and look at all these get political prisoners we have right now suffering in dungeons and being abused and being given crazy terms for doing virtually nothing. Um, you know, and the one few that did do some things, you know, I, I agree that they should have gotten some sentence. We have to have law and order and you can't just go in and tear down the Capitol and things, but it wasn't, you know, what everybody said. But here's another, I'm going to pull up a couple things here. We won't need volume for this, uh, but I want to show you a couple other things, and I'm going to pull this up on the screen if you can. Uh, sorry. <laughs> there we go. If you could pull that up. So H.R. 645 was signed. This was in 2009. I think it was under George Bush. This was right after you know, uh, shortly after the 9-11 attacks and then after we went into Iraq and stuff. So they decided to come up with the National Emergency Centers Establishment Act. Now, what people don't understand is if you ever heard of Publication 7277, it's called the United States Plan for Complete and General Disarmament in a Peaceful World. And it was passed in 1961 or at least started in 1961 under John F. Kennedy with the United Nations. And John F. Kennedy and them were saying, okay, only through the United Nations can we have peace and so on. So this National Emergency Centers Establishment Act, I believe, kind of coincides with that because in Publication 72.7, at one point, it states as they start to give more, I'll give a synopsis of the 70. Uh, publication 7277 basically it states that they're going to create a united nations peacekeeping force they will have forces in every country part of that un peacekeeping force they will dra dramatically reduce nuclear arms around the world among all nations they will reduce military armies down to two million or less per each big uh country and then they'll start taking all arms 
And the only people that will have arms basically are United Nations peacekeeping forces, uh, the force and multi-jurisdictional task forces, they call them basically, which will be like the pol military police, basically. And so this now and in that plan, it says they will convert military installations for other uses. This is in 1961. OK, think about that. Now, let's look at this article. It says this is the bill. Now, look what it says to direct Secretary of Homeland Security to establish national security centers on military installations. So this is exactly what they started doing. And that documents from 1961. This is 2009. But did we, can I ask you this question? Yes. You, this is from 1961. Did we have a Department of Homeland Security in 1961? No, no. Listen to what I'm saying. I, I'm sorry. Um, publication 7277 was established in 1961. That okay. was an agreement with the United Nations in the United States okay. to start reducing nuclear arms. Gotcha. But then they said... They will gradually take all armaments from everybody, small arms, big arms, small arms, everything. everything. A little uh, and, and then they state in publication 7277 from 1961 that they can convert military bases for other purposes. Now you go forward to 2009 and the Secretary of Homeland Security can establish what they call national emergency centers on military installations. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. So they started it back in 1961. When I talked about these articles, you know, people are like, oh, it's 1961. That stuff has no relevance anymore. But yet in 2009, they're doing exactly what 1961 document states. That's my point. So uh, the establishment of national emergency centers. Okay. Gotcha. And then you have, uh, let me see. There is another one. Let's see if I can find it here. <laughs> I have a list of them here. Um, right here. This is Army Regulation 210-35. You notice the word installations and civilian inmate labor program. <laughs> you, oh, wonderful. It gets better. <laughs> now, this is from 2005. It's a summary. Civilian inmate labor program. Rapid action. Revised date 2005 assigns responsibilities to headquarters, installation management agency, and so on and so forth, provides Army policy and guidance for establishing civilian inmate labor programs and civilian prison camps on Army installations. Now, what the hell is this? If this isn't a FEMA camp, what is it? And that's why I want to show people this, because everybody talks about, oh, FEMA camps, and you know it's all conspiracy theory, but yet... I'm showing you the documents, people, where they actually tell you this stuff. It's a cooperation between civilian police and the military to build civilian labor camps. <laughs> you Question. can look this up. If, if, if they are planning on doing this, uh, instead, I know that this, this bill says they, they could do this, but instead of using military bases and converting them to for holding these what they would basically be calling enemy combatants, right. <laughs> treating civilians like that. Why not do it? What a lot of people have speculated they're doing, and take abandoned WalMarts and that sort of well, thing, former uh, civilian structures, and turn them into these camps instead of instead of using the military camp. Save save the military for military purposes. Well, that let me tell you. I mean, you're right. And they, and if you look through the provisions, you read through all this, they can do that. They can, they can, they can, uh, it's almost like eminent domain. They could go in and they can take over. That's what they did in World War II. They did use areas that were already built in many cases and then just kind of rebuilt them. Um, so they can do that. But again, when I was in the military coming back uh, from overseas in 91, 92, remember around that time, they started shutting down military installations, certain yeah. ones, and they started then converting them to these civilian, uh, well, these national yes. emergency centers and so yeah. on. So I think it's going to be a combination. I mean, of course, they're not going to have enough military installations to shut down to make these. So I think they're having they're they're having a cooperation of both. Um, they'll probably even use federal prisons and things of this nature you could too. Use, I mean, you could use hangers at uh federal airports 
they can use whatever they choose. You know, that's the thing. But I do think that it's also going to be, um, it will be um, federal prisons and things of that nature too. If you read through this whole policy statement, which I've read through pretty much a couple times, it shows all of these things and how they can, um, you know, set this up. It goes through and it shows the compounds. It, it shows everything in this uh, document. So you've got that. And then when I was, um, let's see if I've got it up here. I may have uh, taken it back off. I want to show you too, when I talk about publication 7277, they talk about how they're going to reduce all armed forces. There's a there's approximately 175 countries that have major armies around the world. And I wrote an article on this back in like 2010 or 11, but they they have these uh, uh, so they have this plan and on here if you look at these international military groups, what they say in the document of publication 7277 is no military will have more than 2 million troops. This is what they want to reduce it to. Okay. Um, and I've shown how from the time from 1961 until now, they greatly reduced the amount of nuclear weapons the United States and Russia has. We still have a lot, don't get me wrong, but they greatly reduced it. And then the militaries have been greatly reduced as well. The largest military is probably China. And I'll show you if you look at the central, uh, let's see, where's China at here? The People's Republic of China, they have a total if you look over here, of 4 million troops that they can amass. That's with their reserve troops and, and active duty troops and everything else. Whereas the United States and Russia were the ones who had the START Treaty. Remember the START right, Treaty? Right, yeah. That's part of, that's the offshoot of the of the 70, publication 7277, the START Treaty. And I talked about that, but if you go down to where Russia is, you can see, let me see, oh, da, 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 R. Where's the R at? Okay, so we have Russia. They're down to approximately 3,874,000 troops. That's with everything. Uh, their regular army is at about 1.5 million. And then they have reserve troops. So they're getting very close to, to bringing them down. But then let's go to the United States. And if you look at the United States, they've been very aggressive with all troops right now, we have approximately 2 million troops. They state. And this is uh, the updated uh, approximation. So my point is they are pushing that agenda and getting these things in line as best they can. Now, here's what they said they would do. They would then create the UN peacekeeping forces. So here's my thing. Right now, we know that um, we see around the world... Uh, and especially in the United States, we see this program for mass migration. And now I did a show recently where they were showing on the news that they're accusing Putin of putting the Wagner group down in northern Africa and around Rwanda and so on, because there's a massive migration route there. And they're claiming that Putin is gu guiding that route to go to UK and to Europe to affect the elections there. And it may very well be so, but the point is they're pushing all of these massive uh, migrants in. And then here in the United States, we see the same thing. We see this massive problem and they're paying them. I was just listening to the news today and in New York, in some cases, nine to $10,000 a month. I'm, a, I'm like I said, I'm going to put a turban on and go, okay, I'm here, you know, and just run over the border real quick. So I can get a car. Or something. I mean, and, <laughs> And again, I don't blame a lot of the people coming, but you got to remember reports are showing 70 to 80 percent of these people, military age men. So, David, what you were talking about is my summation. I did a show the other day, a real quick show on this, and I said, here's what they want to do. They're creating these wars overseas. I think they're going to ramp them up. They want to control them. I don't think they want nuclear war. People, they're pushing that idea they want to ramp up the scare of nuclear war again so that they can then remind us of the START Treaty and publication 7277. And they can come in as the saviors and say, hey, we're going to reduce these military, you know, nuclear arms more. And we're going to create a national peacekeeping force to keep us all safe and all of this nonsense. 
I think they're still trying to revamp that because it's not very popular with people because of alternative news media that's exposing this stuff. But they can take all of these immigrants coming into the United States. And David can remind me of the governor or the senator who said, oh, we'll just take the, uh, uh, you know, these immigrants and make the them. That yeah, was Dick Durbin. Yeah. See, that's why I love you. Uh, because every time I come on the show, I can't remember Dick Durbin's name. And so he always helps me out there. Uh, so Dick Durbin says this. So, again, this is a problem reaction solution scenario. They're the ones that created the problem with massive migration. They're the ones that said they want to defund the police to get a response from the right. No, we need police. And then they come back and say, OK, well, we'll give you police and National Guard. <laughs> you know. Yeah, right. But at the same time, these National Guard troops are not going to be too likely to want to um go in and start disarming people so if they can send a lot of our troops overseas in wars to be embroiled there they can then create you know this new army dick durbin wants in them oh yeah so, well, these, we'll chinese, these, foreigners. these chinese and other immigrants right. will have and, no problem disarming americans right and they'll have no problem coming in and shooting you and taking you yeah. to a concentration camp near you you know the happy clown camp as the yeah. You know, uh, or the uh, what was it? The re-education camp for uh, MAGA guys, as uh, yeah. as uh, Hillary Clinton said. Yeah. So, you know, my thing is, I wanted to come on the show today and talk about this to really make it a reality and not so spooky and theoretical, but to show people like this is a big reality. People, this is a real thing. That um, so we have to be careful. And my point with Donald Trump was. I like Donald Trump. I support him. But he's even talking about building concentration camps and stuff. So my point is, I'm not saying he's going to use it for nefarious reasons or good reasons. But you got to understand that we have a deep state. We have the NSA, the CIA, and these rogue agencies that they don't follow plans. And they don't follow people's <laughs> orders. They didn't follow Trump's orders last time. You, know? but you can create something with a good purpose in mind. And then have it usurped by the deep state and powers that be. And if he's only there for four day, uh, years, right? then what are they going to do after that? Yes, I think it would be called Camp Nowhere for demo rats. Exactly. So, so that's a big issue. And like I said, um, if you uh, – let me see something real quick. I'm going to see if I can find that real fast. Um, so here was actually – I'm going to pull this up on the screen here. So this was, I, I just want to show people that I have been on this, reporting on this for years. And so if you look, this is my uh, website, Six Emperor Tyrannus News, that I've been neglecting, but it has a lot of archives. And one of the things, I'm sorry? 2013. Yes, this article was from 2013. The Army was cutting 10 brigades under the real agenda of publication 7277. This is the document, 7277, Freedom from War, the United States uh, Plan for General and Complete Disarmament in a Peaceful World. You can look that up online. Publication 7277 is now declassified. But I was showing that in that section... They're talking about downsizing of the U.S. military. This is a direct quote. The armed forces of the United States and the Soviet Union would be limited to 2.1 million men each with appropriate levels of amount of other military significance. But like I said, we're at 2 million now. Yeah. Russia's at, you know, under 4 million. China's at 4 million. So they're, they're not far off. And then it says... Um, and uh, an experts commission would be established to examine and report on the feasibility and means of accomplishing verifiable reduction and eventual elimination of all chemical, biological, and radiological weapons. Now, that all sounds good. I'm for some of that. I have no problem. But they say, now here's, this was from, again, this is from 2013, but I want to show people how I've been reporting on these things for years. And uh, in... The CBS News report back in 2013, they said, in a massive restructuring, the U.S. Army is slashing the number of active duty combat brigades from 45 down to 33, 
shifting thousands of soldiers out of bases around the country as it moves forward with a long-time plan to cut the size of services by 80,000. Officials say sweeping changes would eliminate brigades at 10 Army bases in the U.S. and by 2017, including Texas, Kentucky, Georgia, Colorado, North Carolina, New York, Kansas, Washington. The Army will also cut thousands of other jobs across services, including soldiers and units that support the brigades and two brigades in Germany have already been scheduled for elimination. But um, if you go on and look at publication 7277, there's three stages that they have. And this is kind of just a diagram of it. As the United States and Russian forces decrease, the United Nations peacekeeping force will increase. This is what they wanted in 61. And if you go at stage three, it says we're certainly headed towards the goal of these globalists. I'm writing this part who are setting up a post-feudalist New World Order under publication 7277. Stage three of the program will bring a dominant United Nations and one world standing army. No nation will have the ability to challenge the United States. And this is a direct quote from publication 7277. In stage three, progressive controlled disarmament and continuous developing principles and procedures of international law would proceed to a point where no state would have the military power to challenge the progressively strengthened UN peace force and all international disputes would be settled according to the agreed principles of international conduct. Then I wrote another article. This one was from 2010. A World Without Nuclear Weapons, Obama's U, uh, idea, or is it a UN agenda? And again, I talk about the United Nations. And President Obama, back in 2010, was talking about this in Prague, and he said they have to get rid of nuclear weapons and the United States would be committed to this. He said nuclear weapons are the most dangerous legacies of the Cold War. The U.S. will take concrete steps and will begin the work of reducing our arsenals and stockpiles. And he talked about this, you know. And so my point with this is if you read through publication 7277, it doesn't just talk about nuclear weapons, but they try to make it sound that way. If you go through the whole article, it starts showing you they're talking about all armaments. And they state that the only people that have armaments is the United Nations Peace Force and the multitask jurisdictional task forces. Everyone That's else will be think. disarmed. Now, and what I did I is think, I... Do you think, ahead. real quick, just a quick question. Do you, do you remember back in, I think it was 2012, uh, uh, maybe it could, it could have been 2011, could have been earlier than that, but when Obama was firing a lot of these top generals, because I think they were... You know, he had presented this. They refused to say that they would turn uh, the military against the American people. Right. He let them go because of that. Right. And remember, they there was a document that was released in a major news account back in the early 90s where Marines were given surveys and they were asked, would you shoot American citizens? Would you disarm American citizens? And one of the Marines, I guess, was alarmed by it, and he leaked it. You know, he got it out somehow and got that information out, so it became mainstream. And so, um, and then you see a famous video of the guys down in Hurricane Katrina, and one of the reporters walks up to one of the uh, soldiers, and they're walking through there, and they're armed, and he says, um, you know, how do you feel about this or something? And the guy said, yeah, you know, this is... You never know, you know, when you kick in the door, if you might have to, what you may have to do. So it, this soldier basically is, you could tell he was concerned about it, but he also, he reminded me of the average German soldier that says, I was just following orders, you know, yeah. when they, after they shoot you. And um, so William Jasper in the United Nations, uh, he has a book called The United Nations Exposed. I found a quote from there. He, uh, this was from Arnold Toynbee, the director of studies of Royal Institute of International Affairs, which then later became the Council on Foreign Relations here in the United States, but it's like theirs overseas. He said in 1931, we are at present working discreetly with all our might to wrest this mysterious force called sovereignty out of the clutches of the local nation states of the world. Wow. So, um, so again, they want to wrest control from us and from the people, we the people, they want to destroy constitutions and so on, and they want to build this international military. And these stages talk about the final stages in the work. This is an article I wrote, like I said, in 2010, are the re uh, over all remaining powers. Final stages are in the works to turn over all remaining powers militarily 
through the creation of a UN army, financially through the creation of the International Federal Reserve, and now the World Economic Forum and the Bank of the World and, and you know, and all of those agencies, legislatively through the climate control bill, which will open the door to international taxing and regulations. And this September coming up is the SDGs big summit, and they're pushing the sustainable development still. And then Nash, then also sovereignly through the immigration reform bill, paving the way for the completion of the North American Union and a national ID card and chip implants and so on. Now, these things always fluctuate a little bit. This was 2010, but it's still generally what I've shown in here is basically happening. Look at the immigration. Look at what the Republic, the Democrats are trying to push. So all of these things are going on. And so they I talk about how they do uh, the problem reaction solution. And in this case, let's look at this. I said problem. The U.S. State Department will say, oh, Ahmadinejad has uh, the capability of getting nuclear weapons. Well, who was Ahmadinejad? He was leader in Iran, right? What are they saying on today's news? Iran's going to get nuclear weapons. Yeah, nothing They're saying changes. the same thing. I said this 15 years ago. Reaction. Joe Couch Potato. That's why I call the American. Ah, we need to get that bastard. Stop him from getting the ability to get nuclear weapons. So they create this fear, get everybody to go, oh, we got to get them. And then the solution is the U.S. president and the U.N. council says, we'll save the world by getting rid of all the nuclear weapons. He, oh, except for the ones that we need, in case you get out right, of line. Except for ours. Exactly. So now this is the publication. This is the actual publication, just to show people. The United States program, and you can go through this and read it. Freedom from War, uh, John F. Kennedy signed this and said it was such a great thing, how the U.N. peace powers are going to be strengthened, and you can read through this whole thing. It's not a real big article, and I'm not going to go through it all, but take the time, audience, to read this thing, and you will be terrified because everything we're seeing is based on this document from 1961. So it's amazing and I've been following this through the years. And so this is why I wanted to show people that uh, this is a very real event that's going to uh, usher in. And I and, and with all due respect, I, like I said, I, I'm voting for Trump. And I believe that out of all the candidates, he's the best one. But what I'm saying is Trump has to be afraid. Trump has to be aware. And I'm hoping he's really coming in with his game plan this time you know, to really be ready for these people. But we also have to understand that's four years. He can't change the world in four years. Maybe he can. One man could do it, but we can't rely on that. And I'm by no means in any way trying to attack Trump. I, I, I give great credit to what no, he did. But we have to watch everyone. We have to be. Yeah, we have to. Yeah, we have to trust, but verify. I'm not like a big fan of Reagan, but Me we have to trust and verify. Um, I was until I researched him. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, he added a bunch of council and foreign relation members into his cabinet. But here's my thing. I think that Reagan came in sincerely trying to do right when they shot at him and they got him in line. Remember, he wasn't going to bring Bush in until he decided to bring Bush in. And all of a sudden, he started bringing all these council foreign relations members in and he made the agreement with the Vatican People don't understand in 1984, we made a, we brought, we normalized relations with the Vatican. We had, we had cut them off after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln because we believed that they conspired with the South to, uh, to try to overthrow the United States. They, they believed that uh, they had a hand in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And basically, Congress and them cut them off and said a, a Catholic couldn't even hold office. This was for years. And a lot of, a lot of people don't know this. That's right. Oh. And then in 1984, Reagan put a red line phone in his office straight to the Vatican to call Big Papa, you know. And uh, I think that the Pope has that song in playing in the Vatican. I love it when they call me Big Papa, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think you're it's right. It's just a side note. But and then they have to go over there and kiss his feet and his ring and who knows what else. Um, and except for Biden, he goes over and poops at the Vatican. In his pants. Yes. So I remember right. that news story. So my point with this is, yes, we, you know, everyone out there who is going to vote for Trump, vote for him, go hard, get him in there. But then let's really 
really, you know, push to keep him in line. And I'm not saying he'd get out of line, but what I'm saying is we got to keep the alternative news media really pounding the truth, getting this information out because, um, and then hope and pray that he will get good leaders in there with him that are actually going to defend him and not be turncoats and everything else. Agree. And we really have to worry about the military. You know, th this is the biggest problem is the, the NSA, the CIA, the other alphabet agencies that we don't know about, um, the deep state, half of Congress or 90 percent of Congress, probably, um, you know, and then even local levels and so on. And then the sheriff's departments, they have to be educated in the fact that they have power we in their state. We need constitutional sheriffs. Constitutional sheriffs and educated constitutional sheriffs yes because they have to understand they have when the feds can come into their county they can tell them get the hell out you, you have no jurisdiction we already have some that have said we will not take guns away we will not right the second amendment rights and for the longest time you you look at the, the the media campaign to make sheriffs look stupid if you watch andy griffith's show you know that uh, barney five couldn't even put the bullet in there without shooting his foot and st so on they always made sheriffs look. By the way, Barney Fife is uh, 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 <laughs> teeny. <laughs> yeah, he shot his part. Right, hunting and, and so they'd always make sheriffs look like they have no power too. If you watch a lot of movies, the sheriff will be there on the scene, and then the feds will come in. Oh, we're taking over here and just push the sheriff right, out exactly. of the way. The sheriff exactly. looks like some country bumpkin. And they do that purposely to try to make people think sheriffs don't have power. They, you know, this is all subliminal. And so that's why I was saying Yuri Bezmenov talked about this demoralizing the country, destabilizing the country, creating a crisis, and then normalizing it. Now, think about that, too, with the COVID. After they created the COVID crisis, what did they call it? The new normal. I mean, they went exactly by the blueprint that Yuri Bezmenov was talking about in 1985, for crying out loud. So, you know, I, um, I, I've been thinking long and hard about this. So we've got all these um, military age men coming in. And then remember, there was one report where one of the uh, one of these guys that were down there following the immigration path and stuff. Remember, they stopped one of the guys, a young guy, and they said, hey, you know, they tried to talk with him and the guy was friendly and, and the guy showed him his credentials and stuff. And he had he and and he had the, the card where he was getting paid monthly. But they asked him, you know, what are you doing here? And remember, he said, I'm a United Nations soldier. He told him that he's a United Nations soldier. Now, I'll have to find that clip again. But he literally said that. He was this foreigner. He said, yeah, we're United Nations soldiers. So I don't know what the hell they're telling them when they send them. But they're probably telling them, don't worry, you're going to get over there. You're going to have a good job. We're, we're, we're applying for United Nations peacekeeping soldiers, you know. So they're sending all these people here. And I don't know if it was just him saying that or if this is a plan, but it sounds more and more like it's a big plan. You got the Chinese, a lot of these, I, I did a show where they're Chinese Communist Party affiliates. There's recent reports where some of them are dropping their military IDs along the route. They found military IDs of some of these guys. So from different countries and stuff. So again, for people out there, you can stick your head in the sand and you can just say, oh, this is all crazy. Or you can at least be aware of it. Keep your head on a swivel, as we say in the military, and watch your six. That way, as we see these things develop and we can be aware. I personally don't think there's going to be a good ending. I think that we're ushering into the beast system. The one world government system is coming. And. Get away from this fallacy that it's going to be this big apocalyptic thing. It's not. the The slow creep is happening behind the it's scenes. Going be more it's, it's going to be more. It's going to be more. Yes. Mark, can you explain to people the realities? Because everyone thinks that martial law is a good thing. Can you explain to them yeah. the realities of martial law? Well, I here's my thing: is remember that there was a saying, and I can't remember who attributed it to it. Is they said, "I would rather have dangerous freedom than." Uh, secured enslavement. You know, freedom is dangerous. Freedom means that people can do what they will within a certain extent, and you have to take that chance. That's why we have the Constitution with Second Amendment that says you have the right to keep and bear arms to defend yourself. And so, martial law, uh, 
it, it's kind of like the um, the ten, you know, uh, what is it, uh, the, the ten enumerations uh, for the federal government. You know, they, they have very limited power, and that limited power should always be checked. Sometimes it's a necessary evil that you need martial law. I'm not saying in every case there can't be um, reasons to, to bring in National Guard troops. Um, you know, national emergencies are can be real, and they can have limited use sometimes. In Hurricane Katrina, I had no problem with National Guard troops going down there. I had a problem with them disarming people, though. Yeah. But if they were to go down there to do humanitarian aid, to help out, and to do some policing and stuff, because there are crazy people that break out when you have these types of events, I get it, but it should be very limited. And the Constitution does allow for it in times of insurrection and things of this nature. The problem with it is the Democrats and, and the, the, the neocons in them don't know how to properly interpret that, so they use it for power. You know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So I think martial law is not good or bad necessarily. It's how we apply it and yeah. when we apply it. Mark, do you remember the movie The Siege? It was a 1998 American action thriller but uh, about uh, terrorist cells which made attacks in New York City. It stars Denzel Washington, yeah. Annette Bening, who actually went to school with my husband, uh, and Bruce Willis. And so Bruce Willis comes in. He also does torture, but he comes in and he says, you don't want martial law. Right. Because we will take... Uh, the, the individuals that are in charge of that city will make the decisions for right. all of the citizens there so they can execute you, they can torture you, they can do whatever they want under martial law. People seem to be under some fallacy that martial law is a good thing. Right. And I, I will contravene that and say, no, it is not a good thing. And I will second that. Um, I agree with you. And uh, remember that they have a league with a lot of the pastors and ministers across the United States. They read the old Roman 13, you know, all, you know, we're under government law and, and all law is from God and all this. No, it's not. Um, I beg to differ. That's taken out of context of, of the New Testament. You know, it's showing that just because law is given and allowed by the Almighty, in other words, you know, the, the Almighty gave us all free will, right? We can create dictatorships or whatever we want. Doesn't mean it's good. And so I agree with you, Penny. We have to always, things like a uh, martial law scenario must be very limited, targeted. It should have clear parameters for when it starts and stops and so on. You know, it should be very well regulated. But in some instances, you may need it. And so, like on the border right now, we have a national catastrophe, obviously. A massive invasion. But we don't have, you know, why aren't we sending troops down there? Well, obviously, it's not part of the agenda. So I think that, you know, the major thing is what has happened is we have lost control of our government. The government has now turned against us. It's sided with the deep state. It's sided with the dark forces. And it is, it's a snowball effect. And I, I think that we can kind of shave it off, shave off parts of the ice on the snowball. But that snowball is, is not going to get stopped. And I don't care. I hear... A lot of alternative news channels, and God bless them all, but, uh, you know, like, oh, we're going to stop the New World Order. No, we're not. We're not, people. Just relax and calm down and get reality. And I know I sound like a pessimist. The, the EBS is going off any moment now. Yeah, oh, and no. the white hats and, you know, and all that nonsense. I mean, I'm not knocking anybody and their beliefs, but what I'm saying is a lot of that's pie in the sky. When the reality is, here's my thing is, behind the scene, this is why they're having all this stuff in front of us. You know, they do all this crazy stuff. I think a lot of it, they do it to get us a little bit perturbed and we report on it. But I always try to report on behind the scenes. What is the World Economic Forum doing? What is the United Nations doing? What is the World Bank and these banks doing? These are things that people aren't paying attention to. They're doing the SDGs. They're doing, you know, this these uh, the sustainable development goals. They're pushing the ESG scoring system, you know, the credit systems. They're pushing a lot of this stuff behind the scenes while we're fighting over uh, gender stuff. And, and I'm not saying that's not important, but that's what they do. They get us to 
fight over stuff that you know, it's not really going to make a hill of beans a difference if we do it. But behind the scenes, if we're if we instead were fighting the United Nations policies and we were going against the World Economic Forum and we were getting, you know, like you said, statesmen and stateswomen in offices and in power. But look at what they're going to do. You're going to start seeing more and more of these foreigners in public office and moving into Congress. I talked about CARE a long time ago in the Islamic Republic. They have Islamists all through every state now in positions of power. You know, it's crazy. And they're going to continue to do this until they destroy our country. It's coming, in my opinion. <laughs> Mark, Other than that, everything's great. Everything's great. Where can week. people find you? They can find me hiding in my bunker. There you uh, go. But uh, <laughs> when I'm not hiding in the bunker, they can go to Six Semper Tyrannus News on Rumble. They can go to Hard Hitting Truth on Facebook. They can even look up Mark Matheny, but I don't tend to friend people. So, um, But if they can go to Hard Hitting Truth and they get all my videos and they get the Awake Nation re re remix of that, and everything as well um and uh and i'm excited for you guys with some new programs coming and i'm going to get some more uh of the uh, deep state file clips and stuff ready um i've just been very busy this last week or so all right well listen i want to tell you you are just fantastic i will say one one thing before we before we let you go you said in some limited circumstances you could support the idea in a national emergency of, of an implementation of martial law as long as you have parameters around when it's going to be lifted and that sort of I get that. The one thing I would caution you on though, Mark, is the fact that I it, my, it is my feeling that if martial law is ever implemented in this country, it will never be lifted. Once somebody hit, does yeah. that, it's going to stay. That's why I, I think we really need to avoid that at all costs. Well, let me state I get exactly what you're saying. I agree with you. I'm not talking on a national scale. I'm talking about counties or states. Like, let's say for 1992, when the L.A. riots started, when it got so out of control, the police even backed the hell out of there. We needed to get something in there to restore uh, law and order. The Constitution allows for that. It allows for times of insurrection. If you look it up, there are instances where the president is allowed to induce martial law. But it, again... It's got to be, it's got to be a very direct, in my opinion, quote, you know, uh, move to stop it, quell it, and then move those people out. And so, one it. final question. So, if this whole influx in, in the immigration, uh, with the flooding of individuals across our nation, results in catastrophic uh, casualties within the next few months before um, the election, and then we declare martial law. Biden's still in office. Is that correct? Or am I thinking? Well, it's, it's hard to say. That's the whole thing. Um, I'm going to do some more research on that and I'll do a show on that because okay. it's kind of unclear. Because if uh, elections are suspended during martial law, yes, th this guy could, wh whoever, Trump, right. I'd say, could stay in there forever. And that's not They good. could. I, 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 I agree, but I do think there's probably very high parameters to do that type of thing. Or even but, an act of war, for instance, uh, yeah. which there, I, I believe the United States is going around lighting fires for the CIA to, to start World War III. So if that, an act of war would also be another thing right. to enact martial law. Well, I agree. And that's why I'm saying, guys, this is a, a big reality. This can happen. So it's not pie in the sky. It's not conspiracy theory. This is a real thing. And I agree with both of you on that. We, we, we don't need martial law, but I'm, I am saying there are times where they can do it. That's why I'm saying they're utilizing a crisis scenario to bring yes. about that implementation on a large scale. Mark, as always, thank you. thank you for being a contributor to the show. We love you, man. Thanks very much. Oh, I love you guys, too, and gals. And, you have, right. and your nice assets. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen the assets, guys. Right. So, I say I'm an I asset, know. but you know, I say I'm a nice asset. So there you go. <laughs> right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Thank Mark you. Mathini. Have a good day. You too, Mark Matheny here on the Awake Nation. We're going to take a very quick break. We'll be right back with the Love Doctor, Doctor.